Dzień dobry Państwu. Dzień dobry, dzień dobry, dzień dobry. Zwykło się mawiać punktualność jest grzecznością królów. Jest godzina 12. To jest pokolenie, które pamięta taki film w samo południe. No to w samo południe. Witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie i tytułem e, słowa wstępu, ponieważ wykład będzie tłumaczony z języka angielskiego na język polski. E, państwo tłumacze poprosili mnie o to przekazanie takiego komunikatu. Kanał pierwszy to język polski, kanał drugi to język angielski. E, prosiłbym, żebyście Państwo posprawdzali, na którym kanale chcecie słuchać e, tłumaczenia, bo z całą pewnością są wśród nas i tacy, których biegła znajomość języka angielskiego jest tak znakomita, że będziecie chcieli słuchać po angielsku. Czy już mamy tą sprawę opanowaną? Tak? Dobrze. No to zaczynamy. Dzień dobry Państwu. W naszej historii złotymi zgłoskami zapisali się kronikarze. W ich dziełach czytamy Anno Domini, Roku Pańskiego, działo się w. Z kronikarskiego obowiązku, chyląc czoło przed geniuszami pióra, pragnę zauważyć, że dzisiaj mamy 28 maja Roku Pańskiego 2019. Jesteśmy w miejscu, w którym wszystko się zaczęło. Ten gród nazywa się Gniezno, a ten zamek nazywa się Instytut Kultury Europejskiej. Jakże to symboliczne? Powtórzę, Gniezno i Europejskiej. Polski poeta w polskim poemacie pięknie napisał po polsku My home is my castle. To był tylko żart? Czy głębokie zrozumienie roli Polski w historii Europy, w historii świata? Już słyszę ironiczne i równie po polsku tout le proportion garde. Polska, cały świat? A tak. Nie za dużo? O nie. Kto ma uszy, niechaj słucha. Kto ma oczy, niechaj patrzy. Doskonale to rozumie autor Bożego Igrzyska, Orła Białego, Gwiazdy Czerwonej, noszący, drodzy Państwo, jakże typowe polskie imię Norman. Jakże typowe polskie nazwisko Davis. Zapraszam Państwa na wykład w języku angielskim. Dlaczego po angielsku? Dlaczego tutaj są filmowcy? z kamerami, lampami, mikrofonami. Dlaczego ten ogromny trud i zaangażowanie prezydenta miasta Gniezna, pana Tomasza Budasza, wiceprezydenta, pana Michała Powałowskiego, rektora Uniwersytetu im. Adama Mickiewicza, pana Andrzeja Lesickiego, dyrektora Instytutu, pana Leszka Mrozewicza. Pod waszym adresem, panowie, Norman Davis kieruje piękne polskie słowo za wszystko, co zrobiliście, a słowo to brzmi dziękuję. Norman Davis dziękuję za zrozumienie dla projektu i jego wagi utworzenia na najbardziej prestiżowych uczelniach świata kierunku wiedzy o Polsce i o jej historii. I to jest odpowiedź na pytanie, dlaczego? Dlaczego tu wszyscy dzisiaj jesteśmy? Wykład Normana Davisa w języku angielskim adresowany do słuchaczy z całego świata będzie filmem, pilotem promującym utworzenie kursów, kierunku, a później katedr, kto wie, wiedzy o naszym kraju. Takie katedry ze wsparciem rządów utworzyli Rumunii, Czesi, Słowacy, Węgrzy, Ukraińcy i Rosjanie. Polacy nie. Czy wiedzą Państwo, że o historii Polski na niektórych katedrach slawistyki bywa, że uczą Rosjanie? A w jakim duchu? Pytam. Z jakim przesłaniem? Pytam. Czy naprawdę muszę Państwu wyjaśniać? Nie muszę. Norman Davis słuchał takich wykładów. O, wykład to złe określenie, to jest raczej wypowiedź. Norman Davis pomyślał, wotum separatum. Od sześciu lat chodzi, prosi, działa, jest uparty, jest konsekwentny, jest skuteczny. Ma ogromną siłę przekonywania. Davis tylko i zawsze prosi i nic więcej. I nikt nie potrafi mu odmówić. Dlatego wszyscy tutaj dzisiaj jesteśmy. Moja rola, drodzy Państwo, to organizacja, produkcja, zarządzanie tą realizacją. Nazywam się Krystian Nechrebecki. Mam wielki zaszczyt być z Państwem tutaj, w tej jednej drużynie i dziękuję Wam za to, że zaprosiliście mnie do tej drużyny. A na koniec zabawna anegdota. Nomen omen, historyjka o historyku. Profesor Norman Davis przyjechał tu do Gniezna pociągiem. Chcąc mu pomóc przy wysiadaniu, podałem rękę. Profesor obruszył się. Co Pan robi? Powiedział. No pomagam Panu. No ale po co? Odpowiedział Davis. Nie jestem ani stary, ani niesprawny. Ja w tym roku kończę dopiero 80 lat. A już całkiem poważnie, proszę Państwa. Norman Davis to kruche ciało, ale wielki duch. Jesteście Państwo szczęściarzami. Po raz pierwszy w życiu tuszę zobaczycie ducha. Ducha Normana Davisa. Czy już jest Pan Norman? Popatrzcie się w prawo. Już mamy Pana Normana? Jeszcze nie. To wędruje do nas duch oby naprawdę się zmaterializował, a zanim przyjdzie, to kilka słów tytułem e, 
anegdota, a jednocześnie poczucia humoru profesora Normana Davisa. Jadąc do państwa, profesor w Warszawie poprosił, panie Krystianie, czy mógł pan się zatrzymać przy tym oto tutaj billboardzie, bo chciałbym bardzo zrobić zdjęcie sobie. Ja mówię, no dobrze, zatrzymałem się z piskiem opon, a tam na tym billboardzie było napisane Akademia Paznokcia. Profesor doznał estetycznej rozkoszy. Mówi, Krystian, zrób mi tutaj zdjęcie, koniecznie. No, zrobiłem zdjęcie, siadamy do samochodu, jedziemy. Po półgodzinnym milczeniu profesor mówi, panie Krystianie, ale dlaczego jednego? Ja nie zrozumiałem. Dlaczego jednego paznokcia? Powinno być paznokci. Profesor ma takie problemy językowe. Takie niuanse potrafi wychwycić z naszej pięknej polszczyzny. A teraz już we własnej osobie i we własnym duchu. Norman Davis. Director, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the very kind introduction, which I didn't hear. I'm very pleased and excited to be in Gniezno, the cradle of Polish history, and to talk to you about Poland's millennium, about the thousand years when Poland has rightfully taken her place on the map of Europe. I'm not here to boast about Polish history or to belittle it, but simply to say, but simply to say that this is a subject which deserves to be more widely studied outside Poland. Anyone who wishes to understand the true makeup of Europe in all its richness and diversity needs to examine it as a whole, north, south, east and west and centre, and not to give overwhelming attention to Western Europe. All too often in the past, historians of European civilization, uh, often uh, incorrectly called Western civilization, have beamed in on a few selected Western countries to the exclusion of all the others. Such selectivity is misguided, and we need to ask why. The question is similar to that put to the alpinist George Mallory nearly 100 years ago when he was climbing Everest. Why do you climb Everest, a reporter asked. Because it's there, was the answer. Because it's there. The same is true of Poland. Why study Polish history? Because it's there. Another important problem arises. Historians are frequently seduced into studying the great powers, ignoring all the rest. This habit is unfortunate. Great powers rise and fall and as I demonstrated in a recent book, Vanish Kingdoms, all states, kingdoms, empires are doomed to die, as are all human beings. Little more than a hundred years ago, this town and this region, Wielka Polska or Greater Poland, found itself in the Kingdom of Prussia and was ruled from Berlin. Prussia was one of the great powers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. 
Yet today, Gniezno survives while Prussia is dead and gone forever. The Polish millennium, therefore, beautifully illustrates the principle of changeability, the constantly changing nature of human affairs. Nothing that exists stays the same for long. The map of Europe and the balance of power within it are always in flux. And each of Europe's countries are, without exception and without interruption, subject to unremitting change and evolution. They change politically, economically, socially, demographically, culturally, psychologically and physically as the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus of Ephesus stated, Pantarei, everything is on the move. Poland was once a great power, but was twice destroyed. Today, it is a middle-ranking country, not the strongest and far from being the weakest. It is now a member of the European Union, which in some respects plays the role of a great power in the world. In short, Poland has passed through many phases and many changes of fortune. And it is worth our while to spend a few minutes looking at the stages of its development. From the start of Poland's recorded history in the 10th century, I shall be mentioning nine chapters in the story from prehistoric Poland to the Third Republic in which we are now living. I hope those nine stages are not too much to remember. If nine stages is too much for you, it might be easy to think of them as three times three. Three of those stages belong to medieval history, three to modern history, and three to contemporary history, that is, to the historical period within living memory. Prehistory. I said that Poland's recorded history begins in the 10th century. That fact is not disputed. The accept, accepted date of the starting point is 965 to 966 AD, when a prince called Mieszko, ruling over a people called the Polanie, or people of the fields, accepted baptism into the Roman Catholic faith thereby entering into the community of Christian nations. Henceforth, the events of that people and their rulers would be written down by literate Christian monks, producing chronicles and documents which historians can study. It stands to reason, however, if Mieszko was alive and ruling in 965, that he was born and came to the throne some years or decades earlier. Equally, if the Polania were living here in the valley of the Vata in the mid 10th century, it is obvious that they or their ancestors had moved in and settled here sometime beforehand. All the nations of Europe were once migrants and nomads. None of them has ever possessed a native land since time immemorial. And it is my view that the Western Slavs, including the Polania, drifted into this part of the world in the course of the sixth century, establishing themselves permanently on land which they came to believe, inaccurately, to have been theirs since the creation. Those prehistoric ancestors of the Poles were illiterate Slavic-speaking pagans related to the early Czechs, Slovaks, Wends, Kashubs, and Pomeranians, and about whom archaeology is the main source of knowledge. Historians must also try to decipher 
the many myths and legends of prehistoric times. The best known of those legends sees three Slavic brothers, Lech, Czech, and Rus, wandering across the plains and looking for somewhere to make their home. Czech was the forebear of the Czechs, Rus of the Ruthenians and Russians. Lech pressed on until he came to a great tree in which unusually a great white eagle had made its nest. Lech and his companions made their home next to the tree and took the white eagle as their emblem. Gniezno from Gniazdo means the nest. Pias Poland. In that 10th century, Europe was still divided between the lands that had accepted Christianity and those which had not. The Christian church with its Greek and Latin wings had not yet been split into, by the schism into Orthodox and Catholic. Constantinople, capital of the Byzantine Roman Empire, was the centerpiece of civilization. In the West, Charlemagne's Frankish Empire had broken up, and from its ruins, the modern countries of France and Germany were emerging. Hugues Capet was the first of the kings who subsequently would call themselves kings of France. Otto the Saxon formed the German-based Holy Roman Empire. Athelstan was the first king of a united England. In 988 AD, Vladimir the Great, ruler of Kievan Rus, converted to Orthodox Christianity, thereby starting another time-honored tradition. These were Mieszko's contemporaries who peopled the world that surrounded him. To the north lay the hunting grounds of the fearsome seamen, the Vikings. To the south, Christian Byzantium was confronting Islam. The Roman Pope was one of the lesser patriarchs. And in Spain, the 500-year war of the Reconquista was beginning. Mieszko traced his lineage to a prehistoric ruler called Piast, and Mieszko's descendants in the Piast dynasty ruled Poland for half a millennium. In that enormous stretch of time, the country expanded greatly, extending from the Baltic shore to the Carpathians, standing against the German Empire on one side and the Orthodox princes on the other. Krakow became the capital. The depredations of the Teutonic Knights started in the northeast. The Mongols came and went, and the P.S. princes, who had caused the state to fragment, were reunited on the King Władysław Wokietic, Ladislav the Elbow High. P.S. Poland's last major ruler, Casimir the Great reputedly found a, a country built of wood and left it built of stone. He codified the laws, admitted the Jews who had been excluded from other parts of Europe and founded the University of Krakow. He also changed the country's territorial base, relinquishing Silesia in the West and acquiring Red Ruthenia, including Lvov or Lemberg in the east. In the late 14th century, Poland's western borders with Germany were stable, while turbulence reigned further east. The Teutonic Knights, having forcibly converted the ancient Prussians, were turning on the Lithuanians, the last pagan people in Europe. For their part, 
the Lithuanians had benefited from the retreat of the Mongol hordes had, and had overrun vast expanses of steppe and taiga, claiming the whole of modern day Belarus and Ukraine. Their new creation, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, stretched, as the Americans would say, from sea to shining sea. The freshly recovered state of Moscow looked on with envy. In this unstable setup, the Polish nobles spotted an opportunity. Anxious through the lack of a strong monarch to follow Casimir the Great, they invited the pagan Duke of Lithuania, Jogaila, to marry Jadwiga, the girl king of Poland and to form a Polish-Lithuanian union of vast potential. Jogaila was baptized, changed his name to Władysław Jagiełło, and took the reins of power. The union of Krewo lasted for 187 years, from 1385 to 1572. In many ways, the Polish-Lithuanian Union led to an unequal partnership. Lithuania's ruling circles were absorbed into the Polish establishment. The Polish crown territories, though smaller in size, were demographically, politically and culturally dominant. And the Lithuanian nobility, including the Jagiellons themselves, were Polonized. The Ruthenian Orthodox community, a majority in the old pre-Union duchy, now were a minority group overall. Even so, after some rocky moments in the early years, the Union thrived. The Jagiellons, unsurpassed in the 15th century, added Bohemia and Hungary to their possessions. Polish Lithuanian armies destroyed the Teutonic state, which ended up as a Polish fief, the Duchy of Prussia. Their performance against the expansive Muscovites was mixed, though they had their moments, as at Orsha in 50, 1514. In the early 16th century, ruled from Kraków, the Jagiellonian realms were the largest in Europe. They were strongly impacted both by the Renaissance and by the Protestant Reformation. They were the home of Copernicus and a bulwark against Turks and Tartars. And so to the end of the Middle Ages. For a time in the early 16th century, it looked as if the the Jagiellons might overtake the Habsburgs as Europe's premier dynasty. But the, the last Jagiellonian king, Sigismund August, was childless and decided to transform his realms from a personal into a permanent constitutional union. The joint Polish-Lithuanian Zetpospolita, or Commonwealth, created by the Union of Lublin, was given an astonishing and unique form of government. The state was controlled by the nobles, who boasted a noble democracy, and the monarchy was elective. The powerful Sejm, or Diet, was centralized but the Crown Lands and the Grand Duchy enjoyed wide autonomy. Religious toleration was proclaimed. Society divided into four legal estates, the nobility, the burghers, the peasants and the Jews, was multinational, multi-religious and multilingual. The ruling noble estate, like the slave-holding founders of the USA, 
kept the majority of the population in abject serfdom. The Baltic grain trade, based on the Vistula and Danzig, provided great prosperity. Territorial changes introduced in 1572 reduced the Grand Duchy, giving the whole of Ukraine to the Polish crown, whose rule organized extensive settlement of the steppes. Muscovites, Tartars, and Turks threatened. For the first hundred years, under the kings of the Vasa dynasty, the Commonwealth thrived. But from 1648, during the Swedish and Cossack wars, known as Potop, or the Flood, death and destruction spread on the scale of Germany's 30 years war, ruining and weakening the state. After a brief resurgence under King John Sobieski, who re rescued Vienna from the Ottomans, Poland-Lithuania gradually fell into the clutches of an expansive Russia. The Saxon kings, 1697 to 1763, were mere Russian stooges, puppets. Russian armies, having repulsed the invading Swedes, took control and the interna internal life of the Commonwealth was paralyzed. The last king, the last elected king, Stanislav August Poniatowski, fought in vain to re reform the state and to reassert its independence. But the constitution of 3rd May 1791, Europe's first, was crushed. And in three ruthless partitions of 1773, 1793, and 1795, the country was carved up between its neighbors, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, and in the end was completely destroyed. Never have the mighty fallen so far or so fast. For 123 years, from the third partition, to 1918, no independent Polish state existed. Several dependent states were created, such as Napoleon's Duchy of Warsaw or the Russian-run Congress Kingdom of Poland. But throughout the 19th century, Poland was a stateless nation, subject to enormous social, economic, and cultural pressures over which it exercised minimal control. During those years, Eastern Europe was dominated by three powerful empires, which effectively resisted the ideas produced by the French Revolution and aimed to remodel the population of their newly acquired provinces in their own image. All the laws of Poland-Lithuania were suspended. The serfs were emancipated, but in unsatisfactory ways. Education systems were realigned, and Russification and Germanization proceeded apace. Not surprisingly, armed insurrections broke out, notably in 1830 and 1863, and were repressed with cruelty. Romantic literature thrived. In the Austrian and Prussian partitions, the former Polish Jews received favorable treatment, but in Russia, they were corralled into a pale of settlement. Only in the Austrian province of Galicia, of which the Polish city of Lwów or Lemberg was the capital, and only in the late 19th century was regional autonomy established and a strong native culture promoted, 
Warsaw, in contrast, was Russified, and Poznan became Prussian Posen. In consequence of these pressures, the very identity of the population was altered. The rate of assimilation into the German or Russian cultural spheres or of Jews into Christianity was considerable. The designation of Pole, Polak, which had previously referred only to the nobility, was now applied to any Polish speaker of any class. What is more, following emancipation, national movements took root in all the many ethnic communities. Hence, in addition to Polish nationalism, Latvian nationalism, Lithuanian nationalism, Belarusian nationalism, Ukrainian nationalism, and Jewish nationalism, Zionism, all inspired by German nationalism, challenged the existing order, fermented conflicts, and drowned the legacy of the Commonwealth. One of the few leaders to buck the nationalist trend was Joseph Pilsudski, a Lithuanian of Polish heritage whose independence movement treasured the Commonwealth's multinational heritage. The Second Republic. As Pilsudski correctly predicted, a great war would be necessary to break the grip of the empires and to free the captive nations. This came about in 1914 to 18. Pilsudski's Polish legions fought alongside the Austrian army against Russia, but they were interned before re reaching their goal. In 1917 to 18, the collapse of the empires on the Eastern Front, the Central Powers, helped by the chaos of the Bolshevik Revolution and by US support for national self-determination, gave birth not only to an independent Poland, but to an independent Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, and others. In the general free-for-all, which followed the First World War, Poland and the Baltic states were among those who preserved their new independence. Belarus, Ukraine, and the republics of the Caucasus were among those who lost out. In 1919 to 20, during the Polish-Soviet War, Pilsudski triumphed over Lenin's Red Army which had aimed to export revolution to the whole of Europe. During the next two decades, Pilsudski was the dominant figure in the Second Republic. His main rival was Roman Domowski, leader of the National Democrats, who hated the idea of a multinational society and was, processing, uh, was pressing for a Poland of the Poles, meaning Pola Katolice, Polish-speaking Catholics. In 1926, to quiet his opponents, Pilsudski brought in the army and formed a semi-dictatorship, the so-called Sanatia, overturning the democracy which he himself had created. Similar semi-dictatorships appeared in the Baltic states and elsewhere but they bore little resemblance to the totalitarian regimes of Stalin or Hitler. The Second Republic's multinational makeup caused problems. The Jews, though granted local autonomy, complained of anti-Semitism, though the Ukrainians were undoubtedly, in my view, treated the most harshly. 
Poland's internal difficulties multiplied in the 1930s as the international crisis intensified. The country's leaders overestimated both the strength of their own armed forces and the sincerity of Western allies. They had no answer to the Nazi-Soviet pact of August 1939, which condemned them to yet another partition, this time between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. Like the ancient Commonwealth, the Second Republic was sick, but it fought bravely to survive before being murdered on the joint orders of Hitler and Stalin. And so, to my own lifetime. The Bloodlands of the Second World War. Following Poland's defeat in September 1939, the occupied lands became the scene both of Nazi racial policies and of Soviet social engineering. Each totalitarian occupation caused the deaths of millions. From 1941 onwards, the population was further battered by the colossal military operations of the Eastern Front, first by Operation Barbarossa, and then in 1944 to 5 by the Soviet counteroffensive. Never has death and destruction rained down on innocent people with such sustained ferocity. The Holocaust of the Jews, perpetrated by the Nazi Germans, is but the best known of multiple atrocities. Human life counted for naught in the ideologically poisoned minds of the warring totalitarians. The historian Timothy Snyder has invented the term bloodlands to define the area of Europe where the greatest part of wartime killing was concentrated. And even a cursory glance at the map will show that the bloodlands coincide almost exactly with the territory of the long defunct Commonwealth. This was no coincidence and the main groups of victims were not Russians, as many Westerners believe, but Jews, Poles, Balts, Belarusians and Ukrainians. In 1939, Poland's population stood at 38 million. In 1946, it had fallen to 26 million. During the war, the Polish government in exile, slogan, the first to fight, reached London in 1940, making sterling contributions to the Allied cause, not least in the Battle of Britain and at the Battle of Monte, Ca Monte Cassino. But thanks to the second Soviet occupation of Poland, it lost out to the Soviet-backed anti-democratic communist regime. The tragic Warsaw Rising of August, August, October 1944 was ordered by the government in exile, not by the home army, and has aroused more controversy than any wartime event. In my view, by holding out for three months instead of six days, the Home Army achieved a great military success. The Rising's failure, in contrast, was caused by poor coordination among the Allies, by Western hesitations, and by Stalin's unpredictable conduct. The end came on the 9th of May, 8th or the 9th of May, 1945, three months after Eastern Europe had been handed to Stalin 
at the Yalta Conference. Once again, Polish leaders had put their faith in their Western allies, who once again let them down. The People's Republic. In Western minds, as also in Russia, the end of the Second World War in Europe is characterized by the term liberation. Yet in Central and Eastern Europe, liberation is peculiarly inappropriate. For the liberation from fascism, which did happen with the arrival of the Red Army, coincided with the imposition of a new totalitarian tyranny run from Moscow. Poland never enjoyed an interval of post-war freedom. It passed seamlessly from the horrors of wartime to the different horrors of a foreign communist dictatorship that lasted for 45 years. The post-war republic bore little resemblance to its pre-war predecessor. One half of Poland's pre-war territory had been annexed by the USSR and a large swathe of ex-German lands in the West could only be guaranteed by the new Soviet occupation. Post-war society, refashioned by migrations, repatriations and frontier changes, had lost its traditionally multinational character and was now composed almost exclusively in the national image of Polish-speaking Catholics. Over the decades, of course, the communist regime evolved and mellowed. The worst years of murderous Stalinist oppression gave way in 1956 to an era under Gamulka and Gierek when the ruling party gained a margin of autonomy from Moscow, uh, establishing a modus vivendi with a Roman Catholic church headed by the redoubtable Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski. From the 1960s, however, the so-called worker state was gradually undermined, first by socialist dissidents and then by a revolt of the workers themselves. In the 1980s, inspired by the election of a Polish Pope, John Paul II, the solidarity movement of Lech Wałęsa, a lowly electrician from the Lenin shipyards in Gdańsk, chose to fight the power of the party state by non-violent methods. Established by a countrywide strike in August 1980, it was apparently crushed a year later by the state of martial law introduced by the Secretary General come military leader Wojciech Jaruzelski, only to re-emerge from the underground and to arbitrate a bloodless settlement. The round table talks of 1988 the first of their kind in the Soviet bloc, ushered in the peaceful transition to democratic rule that was completed by Wałęsa's election as president in December 1990. Poland's gradual process of liberation had preceded the fall of the Berlin Wall and acted as a guide for other countries of the bloc. Poland today, the collapse, of, uh, the collapse of communism caused considerable chaos and uncertainty and the construction of a free market economy from the ruins of centralized planning, planning was not pain free. But the Balsarovich plan of 1990 to 91 offered a sound blueprint for three de decades 
of unparalleled growth and prosperity. The presidency of Lech Valencia was hampered by the continued presence of Russian troops. But the new political system weathered the storms. Right-wing and left-wing parties alternated in power. And the 10-year presidency of the shrewd post-communist Alexander Kwasniewski saw Poland adopt a democratic constitution, join NATO and the European Union, and enter the European Union. Throughout those years, Pope John Paul II, Papa Wojtyła, father of the nation, extended his blessings from afar. In 2005, however, after the Pope's death, Poland was overtaken by a surge of quarrels and diversions that have never stopped since. It turned out that a substantial group of citizens, including a large part of the clergy, did not identify with a liberal democracy that had brought so many benefits, pressing instead for a more authoritarian, populist, and anti-liberal public order. What is more, in a bizarre, bizarre turn of events, a pair of twins, minor figures from the old solidarity movement, mobilized the malcontents, formed a political party, ineptly called Law and Justice, and in 2007 won the elections. One of the twins became president. The other, a formidable demagogue, became party leader and briefly prime minister. In an unprecedented onslaught, the ruling party denounced all of Solidarity's achievements. The round table talks were judged treasonable. Owensa was denounced as a Russian agent and the liberal democracy was presented as a facade behind which ex-communists still pull the, the strings. The tyranny of the majority was in place. The first peace government of 2005 to 7 disintegrated, but their cause was greatly boosted by the tragic air crash in Smolensk in April 2010, which killed the president and which could then be blamed on the liberal government and their imaginary collusion with Vladimir Putin. Donald Tusk soon left to take up the post as president of the European Council, but his party, Platforma, withered and peace regained power in 2016. Since then, the ruling party has used its parliamentary majority to attack the rule of law, to breach the constitution, and to lay the foundations of a one-party state. The all-powerful Prezis manages a system reminiscent of the former party Politburo. Tusk is presented as the national demon and there is no end in sight. Ed Please don't believe everything I say. <laughs> exactly 1,000 years ago, in the early 11th century, the Polish throne was occupied by Mieszko's son, Bolesław Chrobry. Bolesław the Brave, Poland's first crowned king. Bolesław staged his coronation here in the cathedral at Gniezno, where the tomb of the martyr, St. Wojtek, already lay. Earlier in the reign, 
on the 11th of March, 1000, he had welcomed the Holy Roman Empire, sorry, the Roman, Holy Roman Emperor, Otto III, to the Congress of Gniezno, which resulted in the creation of a, a metropolitan Catholic see at Gniezno, together with ecclesiastical structures, including new bish bishoprics at Kraków, Wrocław, and Kołobrzeg. Needless to say, the Roman Catholic Church has formed a prominent strand in Polish history ever since. Bolesław Chrobry was a contemporary of Canute the Great, King of England and Denmark, who reputedly placed his throne on the beach and instructed the sea to obey his orders. Canute, or Knut, was lord of a seaborne empire that reached from England to the Baltic, close to Poland. He was the grandson of a Danish king, Harold Bluetooth, who had led his people to Christianity in 1965, exactly as Meshko had done. Denmark and Poland were placed at the time on the very fringe of the Christian world. Naturally, the Poles are extremely proud of the thousand year record though they are nowhere near top of the league in the chronological rankings. 1,000 years seems an awfully long span of time to some and not so impressive to others. Americans, whose country was only founded less than three centuries ago, live in a completely different time frame than the Europeans. Egyptians, Chinese, or Indians, whose civilizations began while, European, while Europe still lingered in the Stone Age, have the longest records to remember. Nowadays, when the internet enables us to look up historical details in seconds, it is more essential than ever to carry a broad panorama of historical knowledge in our minds so that we know what needs to be looked up or checked. That basic knowledge needs to be guided by the main divisions of both time and space, understanding the meanings of prehistory, ancient, medieval, modern, contemporary, and learning to count the centuries <coughs> and to realize the different stages of development. European history is only one part of the whole, and national histories form only one fragment of the European sector, one tiny piece of a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. Nonetheless, it is essential for educated people to cultivate an inclusive approach to history honing an, unaware, an awareness of the rich heritage of others and not concentrating too much on the history of one's own country or neighborhood. Unfortunately, ever since history was formulated as an academic subject in the 19th century, a huge bias has given priority both to national histories and to the history of Western Europe. Those prejudices, prejudices need to be resisted wherever possible. The question arises, therefore, how can the history of Mieszko, of the Jagiellons, of the Commonwealth, of modern Poland, be fitted into the great themes of European history as a whole? I think the answer is very well. If one takes the history of Europe's Middle Ages, for example, the foremost theme is undoubtedly that of religion. It was an era when, with minor exceptions, the Christian faith was ubiquitous and unchallenged. Yet in practice, historians have given disproportionate attention to the Western Church, 
to the rise of the papacy, the investiture contest, the Crusades, and the Spanish Inquisition, and so on, marginalizing the Greek Church and the Sp and marginalizing the Greek Church, Byzantium, and the Orthodox world. On most historical maps, the Jagiellonian realms appear as Poland, wrongly, and are marked Catholic. Yet east of Poland, Lithuania, Russian Orthodoxy reigns supreme. And this is ba barely half the picture. A fuller panorama demands that Byzantium be presented as a prominent fixture of medieval Christendom. And Poland should not appear as a religious monolith. In the history of modern Europe, absolutism is one of the major themes. And he's right to put Louis XIV and the French monarchy at the center of the picture. Absolute rulers can be found at all ends of Europe across several centuries, from Spain to Austria and Russia and the despots of petty states. Indeed, the absolute monarch could be seen not as a European phenomenon, but as a universal one. The vision narrows, however, when historians seek the alternatives to absolutism. Switzerland is mentioned as the United State provinces of the Netherlands or the Serene Republic of Venice or England. Yet the prime exception to the supremacy of absolutism should surely be the noble democracy of Poland and Lith uh, Lithuania. The Commonwealth, a state built on clear, non-absolute principles. Hence, the deep sense of hostility which the Commonwealth aroused in Russia or in the Prussia of Frederick the Great. Unfortunately, the reputation of the Commonwealth was so damaged by the, uh, the paid agents of the so-called Enlightenment despots that it is usually studied in its terminal period as, as an example of decline and degradation. In the history of contemporary U U Europe, no theme is more central than imperialism. In most British and American universities, imperialism, which only declined as the European mo movement gathered pace, uh, it is a consuming obsession that provoked widespread feelings of guilt. This is because the, the seaborne empires of Western Europe, the British, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, and the Portuguese, were deeply involved in the slave trade and hence, <clears throat> and hence in the moral atrocity of race-based slavery. Only last month, the University of Cambridge appointed a special commission to inquire into the benefits which Cambridge may have gained from the slave trade. But wait a minute, I say. Why should imperialism be exclusively associated with the empires of Western Europe? Surely there were plenty of oppressive empires in Eastern and Central Europe, some of which, like the Ottoman Empire, were long time engaged in slaving. Why such a myopic view? Surely, too, there are millions of white Europeans who were victimized by the evil practices of Tsarist Russia, the largest empire in history. It is equally arguable that the Soviet Union of the Bolsheviks, who claimed to be anti-imperialist, but practiced a ruthless form of imperialism themselves, as for the delicate question as to whether the Polish Union, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth possessed its own empire in the East, I leave it an open question. Time, as always, has run out. I've had my say, and I'm grateful to the city of Gniezno for giving me the opportunity. 
Starting with the legendary White Eagle's Nest, I have summarized the flow of Polish history from Lech to Lech, and have shown how Poland's story is an integral part of Europe. Indeed, I would go further. Anyone who claims to be a European historian, but who bypasses the Polish dimension, cannot be regarded as competent. If European history is to mean anything, it must combine all its peoples, great and small, past and present, east and west, and those, as I once said, from the heart of Europe. Thank oh, you. Please. Drodzy Państwo, teraz przyszedł czas na pytania. Mówię po polsku. Have you got any questions? <laughs> Jeżeli Państwo mają pytania, bardzo proszę. Pan Profesor chętnie odpowie. E, tak i pytania. Jeżeli możemy prosić, zaczniemy od wersji w języku angielskim. Czy są pytania po angielsku? OK. How nice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a great speech about Polish history. And I have a question. You present a lot of facts about Polish history, Polish uh, past, and I have a question. What do you think about the uh, future of Poland? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> the short answer is nothing. Um, I'm a historian, not an astrologer. <laughs> um, uh, as you know, uh, I am uh, a British citizen, as well as a Polish citizen, uh, and I think the future of the United Kingdom is much more precarious than the future of Poland. It is quite possible that the United Kingdom will cease to exist in a short time. Poland, in spite of its troubles, will survive for much longer. Okay, the next question, please. Okay, we're waiting for the next question. Ja wiem, że w teatrze najwięcej mówi cisza, jest wymowna, ale może jednak. Dobrze, to w języku polskim, będzie łatwiej, bardzo proszę. A, przepraszam pana, już biegnę. <śmiech> Dziękuję. Już biegnę do ciebie, młody człowieku. Klasa humanistyczna. You welcome. Chciałbym zadać to pytanie pewnie w języku angielskim, no ale jeszcze na tyle nie umiem się wypowiedzieć, ale wiem, że pan mówi bardzo dobrze po polsku. Słyszałem parę pana wypowiedzi. Chciałem na początku podziękować, myślę, w imieniu całego liceum, że pan tutaj przyjechał. Na pewno Polakom mi było potrzebne, żeby ktoś spojrzał na naszą historię z takiej troszeczkę innej perspektywy. O co chciałem się zapytać? Chciałem się zapytać o to, jak pan postrzega, czy mógłby nam pan o czymś powie opowiedzieć o pilotach polskich w bitwie o Anglię, bo to na pewno jest fascynujący temat. No i to jak na razie tyle. Jak na razie tyle. Brawa. To pytanie jest na tak dużym poziomie ogólności, że może ja je... Wiem, może o dywizjonie 303, jeśli już mówię. To jeszcze bardziej wielki poziom ogólności, ale ja sprecyzuję to pytanie. Otóż pan profesor, zrozumiałe, ma fascynację i dywizjonem 303, ale był z całą pewnością taki pilot, taki Polak, który zapadł panu w pamięci. I może tak będzie łatwiej. Kto to był? Boże, jeden egzaminuje Davisa. Chryste, panie. Nie wiem dokładnie, co pan na myśli. Pewnie ten pilot, który miał jakby największy... Pilot z dywizją 303, który miał najwięcej sukcesów w ogóle w bitwie nad Anglią. 
ale on był Czechem. Tak. No, Kropka. Tak. <laughs> ale o to nie chodzi. No, zasługa tych pilotów polskich w naszej godziny niebezpieczeństwa było jak najwyższe. Moim zdaniem oni zrobili różnicy między klęską a zwycięstwem. Kluczowe było nie ilość zniszczeń samolotów, tyle jak liczbę zgonów pilotów. Wyglądało, że będzie brakowało piloci, żeby walczyć z Niemcami. I przyszło dywizją 303 e, i jeszcze parę innych. I oni mieli najlepsze wyniki ze wszystkich. E, oni byli weteranami z 39 roku i z 40 roku we Francji. Natomiast ci piloci Brytyjcy byli strasznie młodzi, bez zaświadczenia i oni zginęli strasznie. Ale ja coś więcej powiem. 50 lat później, kiedy nasze lotnictwo postanowił obelisk na brzegach La Manche, ku czci pilotom z bitwy nie nad Anglią, nad Brytanią, zapomnieli o pisać dywizją 3, 303 i tak dalej. Oczywiście od razu, od razu weterani Brytyjcy protestowali, bo Polacy mają najwyższe reputacje wśród innych lotników. I wpisano późno właśnie te dywizjony polskie na, na ten obelisk. Ale taki jest los w historii, nie? Zwróciliście Państwo uwagę, że profesor Davis nie powiedział English Channel, tylko Kanał Lamasz. To bardzo znamienne. Kolejne pytanie. Bardzo proszę. Tylko mikrofon będę musiał zabrać. Proszę bardzo. Ja bym chciał się dowiedzieć, jaką ma Pan opinię na temat koncepcji wojny prewencyjnej marszałka Józefa Piłsudskiego. Ha. Aha. No mamy bardzo szerokie pytanie. <laughs> Co mogę powiedzieć? Piłsudski miał bardzo szeroki, szeroką wizję świata. To tak jak powiedziałem, to on prawie jedyny przed pierwszą wojnę przewidział, że niepodległa Polska nie, ma, nie widzie bez wielkiej wojny, gdzie te cesarstwa rozborcze upadną. I tak było. Więc e, wojna pre, prewencyjna była logicznie bardzo słuszna. Ale jeden mały problem. Kto będzie prowadził tą wojnę prewencyjną? Polska była stosunkowy mały, mały kraj. Mimo tego, że wojska polskie było większe od wojska brytyjskiego. Większe od wojska amerykańskiego. Czy coś wie o tym? To były kraje rozbronione po pierwszej wojny. E, największe armie e, oczywiście miał Stalin i z czasem Hitler. A kto miał prowadzić tą wojnę przeciw Moskwacami? Nie było nikogo, niestety. Więc dobry pomysł, ale niestety 
w tym czasie niepraktyczne. Kolejne pytanie, bardzo proszę. E, jak ja to zrobię? Ja mam pytanie, dlaczego przez tyle lat jeszcze nie jest wyjaśniona historia odnośnie przestrzelenia samolotu generała Sikorskiego? Pytanie o generała Sikorskiego. Ja tylko dopowiem, że profesor wiele czynił, aby zbadać tę historię. <laughs> Pan używał jedno słowo, wyściela, wyścielanie. Kto wie, że to był wyścielony? Ja sądzę, że nie. Te badania, te pytania trwają teraz 70 lat, ale prawdopodobnie to był głupi wypadek. Nasz, nasze lotnictwo stworzyli komisję, która zbadał to na, w 1943 roku. I wyjaśnienie tego wypadku było tak głupio, że nie wydali swego raportu. Bo się wstydzili. Tak. I przez to miliony myślą, że tam jest jakiś spisek, czy właśnie wyścielanie. Chyba nie. Mo, moim zdaniem to było zwykły wypadek. Ale ja nie powiem, że Pana pytanie jest niestosowne. Tylko parę miesięcy temu ja otrzymałem z Australii list o facetę absolutnie mi nie, nieznany, który napisał, że umiera. Z raka. Ale chciałbym powiedzieć, że jego ojciec przed umieraniem mówił mu, że ten ojciec zabił Sikorskiego celowo. I to nie było głupi facet. Ja napisałem do, do niego mailowo. No, pan mówi różne rzeczy, na przykład, że ten ojciec, który zabił Sikorskiego, walczył z niedwiedzią Wojtkiem osobiście. Chodzi o Wojtka. W Afryce. W Afryce. Wojtka, tak. I ja powiedziałem, przepraszam, Wojtek Niedźwiedź nie był w Afryce. Z powrotem, przepraszam, mój ojciec walczył z Niedźwiedziem w Egipcie. Gdzie jest Egipt? Więc nie wiem, skąd to wszystko, ale jeszcze są pytania, które ewentualnie mogą mieć jakiś sens. Ale z tego, co ja wiem dzisiaj, nie mogę powiedzieć inaczej, niż to było wypadek, normalny wypadek. W książce Szlak Nadziei profesor o jeden z rozdziałów poświęca temu wypadkowi i wytłumaczenie jest tak prozaiczne, że aż się w to nie chce wierzyć. Otóż za profesorem w dniu poprzedzającym wypadek była ochrona. Jeden z żołnierzy zasłabł. Kolega co zrobił? Plecak, który miał na sobie, bo oni byli uzbrojeni i mieli plecaki, wrzucił do samolotu, ale wrzucił w miejsce, które było otwarte. To było miejsce, w którym przebiegają linki sterownicze. On po prostu tam wepchnął ten plecak, bo wiedział, że zaraz kolega zostanie ocucony, ale już go nie wyjął. Zapomniał. Zapomniał o tym. Ja wiem, że okrutna prawda i tak prozaiczna prawda dla nas, dla Polaków może być niezrozumiała. A co jeśli tak było? I potem, kiedy wyłowiono samolot, ten plecak w tych linkach był. I dlatego ten samolot mógł nie mieć sterowności. Ale pewności nie ma. Ostatnie pytanie. Bardzo proszę. Pan, bardzo proszę. Bardzo proszę. In English. A proszę pana, jak in English, to ja biegnę z mikrofonem, bo ja lubię słuchać in English. Slowly, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The mic is your. Well, I didn't have a chance to uh, hear introduction into your presentation. I always read your books in English, of course, and um, it, they are very well written, so thank you for your scholarship and everything related to it. Um, 
and everything that you said today, it's, it's, it's very nice, but you provided such a quick overview of Polish history, a thousand years and 60 minutes. That's, that must be a record. And, um, but my question is more from the British Polish perspective, right? In 1939, right? When Poland was attacked by Germany, right? From my opinion, uh, Britain had everything to lose by declaring the war on Germany. I mean, the war in Poland was not going very well by September the 3rd, yet the Britain decided to, you know what? We don't go throw in the punch, right? Why did you guys do it? I mean, you lost everything in World War II, from the empire to what you said right now, you could trace the lineage of what happened to Britain from really trying to uh, help Poland, right? All the way to a current situation when the country is divided. Why did you guys do it? It's not only a question. It's a discussion Why did too. we guys do it? Uh, I was three months old. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, what you have st stated very clearly is dilemma between the British government, um, the two British governments. Uh, before Churchill, Neville Chamberlain decided not to fight Hitler. As you know, he went to Munich and settled the Czechoslovakia problem very ineptly. But why did he do it? In order to save the British Empire. He knew that Britain was not strong enough to fight a long war um, without allies at the time. Um, and the chief of Pisa decided, as you suggest, then came Churchill, who wanted to fight knowing that the cost would be terrible. But don't imagine that Britain went to war to defend Poland. Britain went to war to contain Germany. And the Polish question was a secondary matter. Um, uh, by good fortune, um, Britain survived the war, but as you say, lost its empire, lost its standing. And by the way, it was incapable of defending Poland. It's not that Churchill didn't care about Poland. Churchill by 1945 had lost his position to Roosevelt the Americans at Yalta only wanted one thing, which was to get Stalin to send troops to fight against Japan. And Roosevelt handed over the whole of Eastern Europe um, to Stalin uh, without any uh, word from Churchill. Um, and that's how it ended. Um, why did we do it? Um, I say the... Churchill's uh, priority was to contain Germany. And to that extent, he was successful. Uh, but his, the British particip participation was very limited. Uh, by <clears throat> 1943 to 44, uh, the only armies which counted in Europe was the Red Army, the Third Reich, and to a limited extent the Americans. The Americans were very weak in terms of troops. The Americans were fighting two wars, one against Japan and the other in Europe. Uh, and Eisenhower possessed less than one-third of the troops that Stalin had. The Americans were second. Uh, the, the Americans had far less troops than the, the Germans had. And whether we like it or not, Stalin won the Second World War in Europe. He decided what the, outco the outcome would be. 
and the fate of Poland or of Great Britain to Stalin was of secondary importance. So what did we, we guys do? We did what we could, but it wasn't enough. Kolejne pytanie. Przepraszam, pan był pierwszy, ale o panu nie zapomnę. Ale to było ostatnie pytanie, nie? <laughs> Przepraszam, przejęzyczyłem się. <laughs> Panie profesorze, moje pytanie jest troszeczkę wywołane pana wypowiedzią. Dotyczy ona tego obelisku związanego z pilotami tak. i z dopisaniem dywizjonu 303. I nie ulega wątpliwości, że Polska ma problem ze swoją polityką historyczną i rolą Polaków w Europie, w różnych krajach europejskich, którzy odegrali znaczący wkład w pewne działania. Jak według Pana Ministerstwo Spraw Zagranicznych Polski Współczesnej powinno regulować i porządkować tą przeszłość historyczną? I jak powinna według Pana wyglądać polska polityka zagraniczna we współczesnej Europie i świecie? Mhm. Okej, okay. do 24 mamy jeszcze kilka godzin. No, super pytanie. Blisko mojego serca. Tylko niestety nie jestem ministrem spraw zagranicznych. To, e, e, ja wiem, że Redyk Sikorski ma, e, jeśli wróci e, do władzy, ma różne pomysły, ale to jest fakt, że przez lata Rządy, rządy, nie jeden rząd, rządy polskie mało robią o swo, aby budowanie swego wizerunku za granicą. I ja próbuję w tej chwili naprawić tą sytuację, ale jestem jeden, właśnie nie ministrem i tak dalej. Ja jestem historykiem, byłem profesorem uniwersytetu, a ja widzę, że wiedza o Polsce za granicą jest żałosna. I dlatego jest tak żałosna. Nie ma studia Polski, prawie nie ma. Tu i tam jest polonistyki, polonistyka, przeważnie w działach slawistyki, gdzie dominują pan wiek to, nie? E, moim zdaniem wiedza o Polska nie powinno być w ręce tych slawistów. To jest beznadziejne. E, I próbuję stworzyć e, konsorcjum różnych uniwersytetów, profesorów, którzy mają ten sam cel, czyli zbudować e, infrastrukturę do wiedzy o Polsce, bo to nie istnieje. To nie istnieje. I e, wolno powiedz byle co. Właśnie ostatnie słowa Nowaka Jezierońskiego do mnie. On umierał i powiedział, że no klęska. Ludzie na zachodzie mówią byle co o Polsce, bo nic nie wiedzą. To nie jest zła wola. Czasem jest zła wola, ale przeważnie to jest ignorancja, bo nigdy e, w normalnych kursach, normalnych klasach, normalnych szkoły coś wiedzieli, gdzie leży Pola, Polska, co, co się dzieje. Problem w, absolutnie nie jest pieniędzy, są z pe, pieniędzmi. Ja bez trudu e, znajduje milion funtów bez, prawie bez pytania. Tylko używać te pieniądze sensownie jest bardzo trudne, bo nie ma, nie ma katedry, jednej katedry e, e, studiów polskich w Wielkiej Brytanii. W Ameryce jest pa, e, pary takich kiepskich, nie bardzo znaczących. Wyobraź sobie, Uniwersytet w Chicago. 
potęga, nie? miasto, gdzie jest milion Polaków. Nie ma porządnej katedry studiów polskich. Jest parę po, posad o literaturze czy o coś, ale nie ma tej katedry, nie ma tej piramidy no, studenci, magistry, doktoranci i tak, i tak. Nie ma. E, I to jest bardzo trudno przekonać Polaków, że jest ich interesy, że świat coś więcej wiedzą. Polacy myślą, my jesteśmy ofiarami, świat powinien przesłać pieniądze do Polski. Nie odwrotnie, żeby Polak dał pieniądze Anglikom. No, przepraszam to, ale tak jest potrzebne. To jest mój problem. Dziękuję za pytanie. Panie profesor wyjął szablę, wsiadł na koni i powiedział, walczę. No i walczę, ale na razie to jedna szabla. Drodzy Państwo, pytanie Pana. Wiadomo, historia powstaje każdego dnia, za naszego życia również. Chciałem się dowiedzieć, jak Pan Profesor postrzega sprawę no, tego niezwykłego wydarzenia, jakim jest rozpad Unii Europejskiej i Brexitu po prostu. Nie złapałem. Chodzi o Brexit. Wszystko, tylko nie Brexit. No jednak, to, to jest chyba ucieszające dla Polaków, że oni nie są tacy głupi jak Anglicy. Przepraszam, mogę to powtórzyć? <głosy> Polacy nie są tacy głupi jak Anglicy. Ale mówię uważnie. Brexiterzy to jest ruch nacjonalistyczny, angielski, nie brytyjski. Dlatego ten ruch rozbije nasz kraj. Ci brexiterzy nie tylko nie lubią Unii Europejskiej, ale nie nienawidzą Szkotów, którzy przez 300 lat są częścią tej, tej wspólnoty. Nie nienawidzą Irlandczyków. Nie bardzo lubią Walijczyków też. I niestety Anglia ma przewagę liczebne i te, te takie wąskie interesy Anglii niszczą interesy no, tej wspólnoty brytyjskiej w ogólnie. I w sercu tego ruchu jest są deluzje o historii. Właśnie, ja mówiłem wczoraj panu Nechreweckiego, dlaczego Anglicy nie mówią The Channel, La Manche, tylko The English Channel. Ta woda nie jest angielska. To jest pół angielska i pół francuska. Przepraszam, tak. Francuzi nie mówią la manche française, oni mówią la manche, ale my musimy powtórzyć la manche angielska. A dlaczego? Dlatego, że ile? 600 lat temu król angielski przekroczył tą wodę, zdobił kale, wypędzał wszystkich Francuzów, stworzył twardze angielskie na drugiej stronie. Więc kiedy Anglicy panowali na jednej i drugiej stronie, ta woda była faktycznie angielska. Ale ta sytuacja się skończyła w XVI wieku. Ale w głowie oni dalej mają ten cały... To jest tylko jeden mały przykład. Oni myślą jakby... Nie sto lat temu. I, I mogę powtórzyć te przykłady. I to jest Brexit. No. Drodzy Państwo, ja niestety mam tę funkcję, że jestem jak Cerber. Time is over. 
Mamy półtorej godziny spotkania, teraz będą autografy. Na zakończenie wspaniała anegdota, którą pan profesor wczoraj mi opowiedział przy kolacji. Leciał samolotem, stewardessa zapytała, kto ma jakie paszporty. I jego sąsiad powiedział, ja mam paszport angielski. Profesor był zachwycony i mówi, proszę mi pokazać paszport angielski. Jestem od 80 lat obywatelem Wielkiej Brytanii i nigdy nie widziałem paszportu angielskiego. Pokazał ten paszport, mówi, no, czy pan nie widzi, że tu jest napisane The Great Britain? Jaki angielski? O czym pan mówi? To trochę odpowiedź na pana pytanie. Norman Davis, dziękuję państwu pięknie. A teraz autografy. I kwiaty. Podpisywanie autografów zaaranżujemy w następujący sposób. Zaaranżujemy w następujący sposób. Ten stół za chwilkę odsuniemy. Będę prosił, żebyście Państwo podchodzili z tej strony, tutaj podawali książkę. Pan profesor tutaj usiądzie. Po prawej stronie pani Sylwia, a po lewej stronie książki będzie wyręczał wiceprezydent. Czy mamy wiceprezydenta miasta? Przepraszam, bardzo proszę. Zapraszam pana, panie prezydencie. I tak to sobie wymyśliliśmy, że poprosimy pana o pomoc. Bardzo proszę, panie prezydencie, zasiąść. To jest pana miejsce. Panie profesorze, proszę tutaj. Drodzy państwo, chwilę cierpliwości. Poprosimy państwa, żebyście się zorientowali. Za moment wracamy do państwa. Prezydencie, jeszcze chwilkę, dobrze? Nie, nie, już wraca, ponieważ państwo...